Today is the Easter weekend of 2018 and this is the Kalavai Venkat podcast. Our topic is Jesus was not resurrected. Resurrection is the most fundamental Christian belief. Resurrection means coming back to life post mortem. The Bible teaches that Jesus was executed by crucifixion. He was buried but was physically resurrected on the third day. It is not a symbolic story. Christians believe it really happened. They celebrate the crucifixion as Easter Friday and the resurrection as Easter Sunday. They also believe that Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection and then ascended to heaven. The Bible says that if Jesus had not been resurrected, then Christianity is false. If there is no resurrection, then there is no Christianity. It is as simple as that. Maestro Ilaya Raja is one of India's leading musicians. He is an iconic figure in South India. He spoke at the Google campus in Mountain View during his recent American tour. He narrated an episode from the life of Ramana Maharishi. Ramana Maharishi was once presumed dead when he was a teenager. He had a near death and out of body experience. He experienced a separation of the soul from the body. He then returned to normalcy. Hilaya Raja contrasted this incident with the story of the resurrection of Jesus. He cited the scholarly consensus that Jesus was not resurrected. He concluded that Ramana Maharishi is peerless when it comes to self-realization. Christians have protested against Hilaya Raja's remark. An organized gang of Christian hooligans laid siege to his house in Chennai. Leftists and Dravidianists usually constitute the vanguard of the Christian church in India. They have heaped the vilest abuse on Hilaya Raja for delaying the resurrection of Jesus. Why are the Christians upset? As I mentioned earlier, if the resurrection is false, then Christianity is false. Hilaya Raja demolished the very foundation of Christianity when he made that statement. Christians realize it. So they are angry and upset with him. In the rest of this podcast, we will learn that Jesus indeed was not resurrected. We will also learn that Ilaya Raja truthfully stated the scientific and scholarly consensus. How do we know that Jesus was not resurrected? I will give four reasons why he was not and why Ilaya Raja is right. Reason number one. Resurrection is biologically impossible. It violates natural laws. Once you die, you cannot return to life. Every objective scholar or reasonable person agrees that Jesus was not resurrected because of this reason. Only Christian apologists and fanatics insist, without evidence, that Jesus was resurrected. They have formed their belief on the basis of an unscientific biblical claim. I can prove that if the same story were told by changing the name from Jesus to something else, then no Christian would believe it. Here is one such story. Sai Baba was a Hindu religious leader. Once a devotee of Sai Baba, a man named Radha Krishna, had died. He had been dead for three days. His body was badly decomposed. His wife appealed to Sai Baba for mercy. Sai Baba went into the room and performed a miracle. Radha Krishna came back to life. He had been resurrected exactly three days after he had died, just like Jesus. He sat up, smiled, and looked very healthy. Sai Baba then told the wife, I have given your husband back to you. Now give him a hot drink. How many Christians would believe this story and worship Sai Baba? None. They would be skeptical that such miracles could happen. They are right. They would demand evidence and point out that the story is scientifically impossible. They would be right again. They would mock the devotees of Sai Baba for believing such a story. However, when the protagonist of the story is changed to Jesus, Christians abandon all critical thinking and become blind believers. The resurrections of Radha Krishna as well as Jesus are biological impossibilities. They did not happen. It is only religious conditioning which makes you believe that either of those stories really happen. However, there is a critical difference between the two stories. This alleged miracle is not a fundamental belief to the followers of Sai Baba. Most of his followers are not even aware of the story. Many would be willing to treat it as symbolic. They follow Sai Baba because of his other religious teachings and the good deeds and social service he performed. That is not the case with the Christians. Resurrection is a fundamental Christian belief. 
Christians take it as the literal truth. They would not be Christians unless they believed that Jesus was physically resurrected. Reason number two. A crucified convict was rarely buried. The Romans crucified the most dangerous criminals. Only those who were accused of sedition against Rome or those who incited the mobs were crucified. Professor Martin Hengel is a historian and leading authority on crucifixion. He informs that crucifixion was the most painful and degrading punishment. It took hours or even days for the convict to die. He died by suffocation as the lungs slowly collapsed. Birds pecked the dying person and desecrated his body. The body was then thrown into a mass grave or a shallow pit. There, wild dogs ate away the flesh. The dead convict was usually denied the customary burial rites. The first century writer, Philo of Alexandria, informs us that only under the most extraordinary circumstances was the body handed over to the family. And that happened only when the governor showed mercy. Professor John Dominic Crossan concludes that after the crucifixion, Jesus' body would have been tossed into a mass grave and eaten away by wild dogs. Professor Marian Saviki is another authority on crucifixion. She informs that the body of a crucified convict was tossed into a lime pit where the remains which had not been eaten away by wild dogs quickly dissolved. If Jesus was crucified, he would not have been buried at all. If he was not buried, then the question of his resurrection does not even arise. A Christian may argue that Pontius Pilate, the man who was responsible for executing Jesus, would have made a rare exception and handed the body of Jesus to his family for a customary funeral. Is it probable? We must remember that such acts of mercy were extremely rare. Archaeologists have so far discovered only one such case. There is a reason for that. The Romans used crucifixion to deter sedition and mob uprising. The painful and prolonged death of a convict acted as a deterrent. The denial of customary funeral was even more shameful because the family could not perform the Jewish religious rites. The Bible claims that Jesus indulged in disruptive acts. He came riding on a donkey during the Jewish Passover when large crowds of Jews had gathered at the Jerusalem temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers at the temple. He urged his followers to sell everything they had to buy weapons. The authorities arrested him. Handing his body to the family for burial would have invited trouble. His followers would have gathered around the tomb. It would have become a sort of memorial. His followers would have mobilized the mobs around the memorial and incited them to indulge in sedition. Why would the Romans have allowed that? It defeats the very purpose of crucifying Jesus. So it is unlikely that the body was Jesus was handed over to the family. We have a recent parallel for this. When the Navy SEALs killed Osama bin Laden, the Americans buried the body at an undisclosed location at sea. Barack Obama explained that he did not want bin Laden's burial site to become a memorial. The Romans would have thought alike. If Jesus was crucified as the Bible claims, then it is likely that his body was thrown into a shallow pit and its flesh was eaten away by wild dogs. The remains would have dissolved in the lime pit. There would have been nothing left to resurrect. There is reason to think that at least some early Christians thought this was what had happened. The scholar Gerd Ludemann cites an interesting passage from an early Christian text, the Apocryphon of James. It records an alleged conversation between Jesus and James. In that conversation, Jesus says that he was crucified without reason and buried shamefully. That sounds very much like how the Romans tossed the dead body of a crucified convict into a shallow pit to be desecrated. In the Jewish eyes, the desecration of the corpse and the denial of burial rites was extremely shameful. And Jesus talks about the shame he had to endure. Reason number three. It is called secondary burial. Professor James Tabor explains a peculiar belief which was prevalent in first century Israel. Jews at the time believed that one's sins were destroyed through the disintegration of the individual's flesh. A family had its own tomb. The corpse was not directly buried. 
it was placed in the tomb which was then shut by a rock the corpse was allowed to desiccate for a year by which time all flesh would be gone the remaining bones were then collected and placed in small boxes called ossuaries the name of the dead person was inscribed on it the ossuary was then placed in a niche in the family tomb this was called secondary burial let us pretend that the romans showed mercy and handed the corpse of jesus over to his family now let us also pretend that he was resurrected what should we expect to find we should expect to find the family tomb with the ossuaries of all other members of the jesus family only the ossuary of jesus should be missing because he was resurrected well maybe the ossuary of his mother mary would be missing too because the christians believe that mary was also resurrected all christians would have venerated the tomb from the beginning no such family tomb which matches this description exists reason number 4 in recent years many scholars have convincingly argued that a historical jesus never existed he is only a myth professor alan dundas shows that the characteristics attributed to jesus are exactly the ones attributed to other greco roman gods of that period like jesus those gods were also born of a virgin they were also crucified and then resurrected if those gods are mythical why should jesus be historical there is hardly any reference to jesus outside the bible in the first century christians claim that the first century jewish historian josephus refers to jesus however the historian richard carrier has decisively shown that the references were an interpolation and a scribal error committed by the church fathers in the 3rd century i will discuss about that in a future podcast i would say this much here neither christmas nor easter were celebrated until the 3rd century even then these festivals were celebrated on widely different dates by each christian group the dates prevalent today were fixed by the church only in the 4th century that reinforces the inference that jesus was a myth for the first two centuries the church historicizes the myth only after that can you imagine indians celebrating gandhi's death anniversary on multiple competing dates such things can only happen with mythical character easter for example was originally a festival of the babylonian goddess ishtar even the word easter is a cognate of the word ishtar the church misappropriated pagan festivals and gave them a pseudo historical pedigree the resurrection of jesus and its association with easter sunday was one such case of bestowing a pseudo historical pedigree if jesus is a myth then he could have neither been crucified nor resurrected how do the christians respond to these arguments christian apologists offer a strange defense against these arguments they argue as follows Jesus had been executed by the Romans he was seen by the Jews as cursed because he had been crucified the disciples were disconsolate and terrified they had every compelling reason to give up christianity yet they risked their lives and endured ridicule to remain christians they gladly faced persecution for the sake of their faith what else but resurrection of Jesus could explain this this argument resonates well within the christian echo chambers Christians tout this argument as proof of the resurrection of Jesus. It is easy to refute this spurious argument. It is hardly proof of the resurrection of Jesus. I will refute it with two analogies. A Muslim could offer a similar apology. Osama bin Laden and many other Islamists have been executed. Muslims are often persecuted or mocked. Yet, Islamic jihadis and suicide bombers are ready to die for the sake of Islam. Muslim women are ready to wear the burqa and forego all freedom. How do you explain this? Does it not prove that the revelations of Allah to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel really happened? Does it not prove that the Islamic heaven and 72 virgins exist? How many Christians are impressed by this argument? How many would embrace Islam tomorrow? I would presume none. A Christian would instead point out that Muhammad was a charlatan and that the Muslims are gullible. to believe those stories of miracle the christians are right let's take another example joseph smith founded the mormon religion he claimed 
to have received a revelation from God on gold tablets. Nobody saw those tablets because they never existed. Joseph Smith claimed that the original Bible had been corrupted by the Jews and Christians and that he had been revealed the pristine version. He was arrested and imprisoned. He was assassinated by a mob while in prison. His followers faced all sorts of persecution and ridicule, but they sacrificed their lives to practice their new religion. Does it not prove that the revelations of God to Joseph Smith really happened? Does it not prove that the Bible is corrupted and the Book of Mormon is correct? How many Christians are impressed by this argument? How many would embrace Mormonism tomorrow? I would presume none. A Christian would instead point out that Joseph Smith was a charlatan and that the Mormons are gullible to believe those stories of miracle. The Christians are right. Christians should apply the same skepticism to the Christian claims of miracle as well. Be it Jesus, Muhammad or Joseph Smith, none of their followers had witnessed any miracle. Their religious conviction was not evidence-based. In every one of these cases, a charismatic person with no scruples or a small group of charismatic persons with no scruples manipulated a bunch of gullible people who lacked critical thinking. Human beings are not always rational. Everyone is sometimes vulnerable. Some are always irrational and vulnerable. A patently nonsensical idea appears quite convincing when you are vulnerable. The birth and rise of Christianity did not require any miraculous event such as the resurrection. It only needed a charlatan to claim that a miracle had happened and a bunch of gullible people who would believe it. Early Christianity had both in abundance. Once Christianity acquired the numbers by converting the gullible and captured power, other members of society just fell in line and conformed. Contrary to what the Christian apologists claim, there is a simple explanation for why the story of the resurrection was invented. Early Christianity was a Jewish sect. Israel was a Roman colony at the time. The Jews were oppressed. Their sacred temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans. The oppressed Jews awaited the arrival of a messiah or a savior. They hoped this messiah would restore peace and subjugate their enemies. Many charismatic Jewish men claimed to be the messiah. A few of them even had the first name of Jesus. Each one of them had acquired a following. How do the followers prove that their messiah is the real one? They turned to the biblical prophecy. The Bible they had at that time was not the New Testament. It was the Old Testament or the Jewish Bible. The people of Israel believed it was a revelation from God. So they looked for a prophecy in the Bible which matched their own messianic candidate. Professor Daniel Boyerin informs us about a prevalent belief in Israel around the time between the 1st century BCE and 1st century CE. This belief is attested by archaeological as well as textual evidence. A 1st century BCE tablet prophecies the death of the Messiah by execution and his resurrection three days later. This myth is a midrash or interpretation of the book of Daniel of the Jewish Bible. In the Jewish eyes, only those who fulfill the biblical prophecy could be the Messiah. So the myth of the dying and resurrected Messiah was applied to Jesus. It was not a historical report. It was an invention driven by the compulsion to fulfill a biblical prophecy. Let me make a brief remark on the claim that the early Christians were persecuted. Professor Candida Moss has decisively proven that these claims are just myths. I will discuss this in a future podcast, but suffice to say that there was hardly any persecution of the Christians until the 3rd century. Even then, it was very short-lived and sporadic. Early Christians faced no persecution at all. However, they invented fake stories of persecution to manipulate the Christian flock and to alienate the flock from the pagans. This is something we see happening in India too. Christians enjoy more privileges than the Hindus. Yet, they fabricate false stories of persecution to vilify the Hindus. They did the same against the Romans too. It is time for the concluding remarks of this podcast. Elaya Raja was absolutely right when he said that Jesus was not resurrected. That is the scientific and scholarly consensus. Only those who are Christian apologists and fanatics 
believe in the resurrection. Christians must be ashamed of intimidating Ilaya Raja. It is not his fault that Christianity is a false religion founded on a false belief. He has every right to speak the truth. It is up to the Christians to examine if they should follow a superstitious religion. This is the 21st century. Yet, today's Christians believe in the same superstitions which early Christians believed in 2000 years ago. Even worse, they brainwash their own children to believe in those superstitions. That is child abuse. Christians become intolerant whenever someone speaks the truth about Christianity. They must be ashamed of their behavior. Christians, as well as India's leftists and Dravidianists, should be ashamed of the vilification of an iconic figure like Ilaya Raja. They all owe him an apology. The government has a sacred duty to teach children that the resurrection is a myth. Otherwise, Christian fanatics will become even more belligerent. Finally, some of you may wonder if Ilaya Raja was wrong in attributing the resurrection to Ramana Maharishi. I do not think he attributed the resurrection to Ramana Maharishi. We should not focus on a word in isolation. Ilaya Raja is a musical genius. He is not a public speaker. He may not always choose the right words. However, pay attention to the description he gives. It is evident that he is talking about the near-death and out-of-body experience of Ramana Maharishi. Those are not miracles. Those are natural phenomena for which neuroscience has explanation. Those are caused by abnormal functioning of dopamine and oxygen flow under rare and ephemeral circumstances. That is what happened to Ramana Maharishi when he was a teenager. More importantly, near-death and out-of-body experience is not the reason why Ilaya Raja venerates Ramana Maharishi. Ilaya Raja venerates him because Ramana Maharishi was a great spiritual master. He was an embodiment of Vedantic teachings. He is seen by many as self-realized. This is true of Hinduism in general. Miraculous stories are peripheral. Hindus practice a strand of Hinduism because of its great spiritual teachings. Every one of you listening to this podcast has a moral duty to support Ilaya Raja for his courageous and truthful statement. I hope you will stand up. The least you could do is to share this podcast with 10 of your friends. I would urge each of you to share it with at least 5 Christians. They too deserve to learn the truth. Modern day Hindus are not used to the idea of criticizing another religion objectively. This is the result of colonial conditioning. After listening to this podcast, a Hindu may ask, why don't we treat the resurrection as something symbolic? Why don't we treat it as something spiritual? Why should we treat it as literal and historical? My answer is, truth matters. Christians have always treated the resurrection as something literal and historical. They zealously go about converting the Hindus because they believe that Jesus was really resurrected. The validity of Christianity depends on the historical truth of the resurrection. The Bible emphatically says that if the resurrection is not true, then Christianity is false. In this podcast, I have decisively shown that Jesus was not resurrected. This makes Christianity a false religion. Let us give the Christians an opportunity to face the bitter truth that Christianity is false. Let us not invent bogus explanations. Thank you for listening. Post your feedback and questions in the comment section. Please avoid ad hominem or abusive language. Let us embrace the truth no matter how controversial it is. Let us debate intelligently.